No one's packed up and left. All right, so we're going to talk about goal-directed design. Now, we've been talking about goal-directed design actually this entire semester. Now, I'm going to get a little bit more concrete about it. All right, because we've been talking about various elements about it. We've been talking about looking at what the user wants to accomplish. So when we're talking about goal-directed design, we're really focusing on what are the goals of the user and how do we apply that to design? Because when we're designing a product, that really is what we want to focus on. So goal-directed design does have a premise. If we design and construct products that allow the user to achieve their goals, the user will be satisfied, effective, and happy. Right, so this is our primary premise. We want to build products that users want to use and that they like to use. Now, there are a number of human-focused or human-oriented design activities we want to make sure we engage in. We've talked about some of them already. The primary one, of course, is we need to understand the user's desires, needs, motivations, and context. We need to know what it is that the user wants excuse me, to accomplish. Now, there are a couple other things, though, that we really haven't talked about much up until now because there are some other aspects we need to think about. Those include some of the business requirements, right? What is the business trying to accomplish, right? Technical issues. There are going to be technical constraints that we need to deal with. Are we building something that's going to be online? Are we building something that's going to be on a handheld? Are we building something that's going to be used on a desktop? Are we building something that's going to be used on a server by thousands of people or hundreds of thousands of people? Those all make a difference. What are the domain opportunities and the requirements and the constraints? So we need to think about not only what the user wants, but what are, what are all of the technical aspects that we actually do typically think about? How do we incorporate those? Because this is all a balance. There are times where we're going to say, you know, I want to focus on the user, and I'm going to make it completely for the user, except that do what users always want. Is that always easy? Easy to implement? Yeah, it's not. It really isn't. So you have to think about what are some of the constraints you need to deal with. Time constraints, budget constraints. What are the goals of the business? Those sorts of things. And you want to take all of this knowledge and use it as a foundation for plans to create products that are useful, desirable, but that also are economically viable. All right, so you want to make sure that you can build something that within your budget you can actually build, in your time constraints you can actually build, and that the consumer can afford to pay for. So if you build a multi-million dollar application, do you think that you're going to survive if you sell it for $5? No. If you're building an application that you're going to sell for $5, very different constraints. Make sense? <clears throat> now, this all makes a lot of sense, right? Another thing about common sense, you're like, oh, why do we have this last? It's just obvious, right? Well, one of the things you're going to find when you get into industry that it may sound like common sense, but you have different forces pulling you in different directions and applying different pressures in terms of what is most important. Now, I'm just going to talk about two of them. There are many of them. We're just going to talk about two of them. So a lot of times you find that you have two opposing forces or more. Here we're going to talk about marketers and developers. Now, why are they opposing forces? Because they have different goals. They have different things that they are trying to accomplish with the product. With marketers, they want to try to understand and quantify a marketplace opportunity. They want to introduce and position the product within the market. So they are focused on how can I market this? How can I sell this? So, a lot of times when you ask the marketers for input, the input you're going to get from them 
is going to be a limited set of requirements that focuses on what do they need to fulfill their requirements? What do they need to make this product more sellable? Now, that's not always what the user needs. That's what the marketer needs. And then they're developers, right? Those people like us. What do we do? We solve, solve these awesome technical challenges because they're really cool, really interesting, and we are brilliant. Right, so we want to focus on these technical challenges. We're going to follow good engineering practices. We're going to be meeting our deadlines. We're going to be meeting our budget constraints. And we're going to put out a product that works well really technically. Because we are in charge of constructing, constructing the product. But as we've talked about in class, when we are focused on getting something that is technically difficult, to work and we have budget constraints and we have time constraints what are we focused on getting it to work right we tend not to really focus on the user and the user goals or what motivates the user those are things that we have to bring into <clears throat> that we need to bring into the design process now there are other issues that we need to deal with. These are actually very, very common issues because there are a lot of products out there that are just like not usable, right? Or they're minimally usable. Well, one of the problems is that, and you'll find this in industry quite a bit, as often as it used to be, where people will say, I want a product. They want to see something quickly. So then you just kind of build something real quick, and then you don't actually look at the design until later on in the design process. This actually is a big problem. Because what happens is you now have spent all this time getting something to work, to work from a technical aspect. You haven't thought about how to design it for the bigger picture. So then you have to go and go back and when, you're, when your users say, well, yeah, it does this, but oh my god, this is terrible. This is really hard to use. This doesn't make any sense. You don't have to go and kind of try to do a facelift. Sometimes people call it putting lipstick on a pig. Right? I need to make it look better. Here's some lipstick. Right? It doesn't fix what the problem is behind the scenes, but we'll make it look prettier. Right? What you end up doing is you end up ultimately developing a product that even if you make it look nicer, it still has a lot of usability issues. Right? It'll irritate your users. It'll take them longer to finish their work, to complete what they're trying to complete. Right? It won't meet their needs. And if you have to expand the system, ultimately you end up with a loaded system that simply doesn't work well. So what does this tell us? When we're looking at the design process, we need to look at our users and their needs in the beginning of the design life cycle, in the beginning of product development. That is a really important part of goal-directed and user-centered design. You start by looking at what the user's goals are not just a bunch of features, but what are they trying to accomplish from the beginning of, the, of product development. <clears throat> this is one of my favorite cartoons, because this really illustrates what actually occurs in industry. Have you guys seen this before, or a variant of it? Yeah, there are a whole bunch, there are actually several variants of it. I don't know who originally actually came up with this because I, you know, you find them all over the place. I have yet to find a reference of the poor person who did all the work to put this together. I don't know who they are, but it's very popular because once you start working in industry, you're going to be like, oh yeah, that's so it. So let's take a look at the design and development process. So this is how the customer explains what they want. All right? Have you guys seen this with a customer? Well, I want this. Oh, but you know, I want this too. And this too. Oh yeah, and this would be a good idea too. 
So that's what they describe. Then you have a project leader. Right? This is the person who's leading the product. Project is talking to your customer. That's how they understood it. Great idea, huh? Then the project leader takes it to the design analyst. And so they go and they design it, but they realize, wait a minute. OK, that's not going to work. Let me fix it. It works, right? Kind of. Then it goes over to the programmer. And the programmer is like, OK, this doesn't make sense, but I've got to get it out there. I have, de I have a deadline. That's how they wrote it. Now, at this point, of course, your client is getting kind of nervous. So our, your business consultant, of course, is describing what they're going to get. Right? Look at that. I'll take that. That's how your business consultant describes it. Right? Because, you know, you want to keep your customer. You want to get your money from them. <clears throat> this is my favorite. How the project was documented. One of the things that um, I have noticed the most when it comes to developers that have worked for me, they used to call documentation the D word because we talk about it every week and they hated it. You know how we talk about people don't like reading? Coders don't like writing unless it's code. So a lot of projects actually aren't documented very well. <clears throat> what operations installed? Yeah, there's a tree and there's you know, a swing on the rope, right? Now, very important, how the customer was billed. They got a whole roller coaster. How well it was supported. How many of you have dealt with technology companies and actually even any other companies, and this is their support. And then what the customer actually needed. Be basic, huh? Now, as funny as this is, I hate to say it actually does occur quite a bit in industry. You're dealing with a lot of people. You're dealing with usually products that are fairly, excuse me, that are fairly complex. And you're dealing with end users who, well, they kind of have an idea of what they want if they see it, but they are not always very good at describing it. They don't understand the technology behind it, so they will rely on people like the business consultant to tell them what they're going to get and what they need. If you use a user-centered design process, that helps minimize the risk that you are going to have these problems. It doesn't eliminate it, but it helps minimize that risk. And by the way, I won't have you identify one of the pictures on an exam. Maybe. No. You don't have to memorize it. But uh, yeah.